Hello and uh, welcome to a new episode uh, from the, of the webcast podcast from the Belt and Road in Sweden. My name is Hussein Askari. Uh, today is Tuesday, March the 8th. Today we are going uh, on an excursion away from the now freezing and very troubled Europe uh, to a more warm place, a tropical area of the world to follow the progress of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, and discuss other important matters related to that. Uh, we are going to discuss uh, the China-Laos uh, railway, uh, which was inaugurated in uh, December uh, the 3rd by President Xi Jinping and the Lao president, uh, Tong Long Sisolit. And uh, there are also other important issues related to this, which we will discuss with our guests soon because the real issue we want to emphasize, we have always emphasized at the Belt and Road Institute that the Belt and Road Initiative is not simply a trade matter. It's not to facilitate trade uh, between East and West alone. The Belt and Road Initiative is a global development uh, uh, initiative, which means that you build bridges and development corridors among nations, among regions, and even among continents, as the map behind me shows. Uh, and therefore, this is a very important issue of the development corridor. And to discuss this matter, we, I have the great honor to present to you Professor Chen Xiangming, uh, Director of Urban Studies Program uh, and Distinguished Professor of Global Urban Studies and Sociology at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, the United States. He's also a visiting professor at Fudan University in Shanghai. Professor, welcome and thank you very much for giving us the chance, taking the time to address our viewers and discuss this matter with us. Well, thank you, Hussein, for the opportunity to be with you. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I think we can start by, if you could give our viewers a, a general idea about the China-Laos Railway first, because we did not really cover this important project yet, uh, its scope, physical difficulties that were overcome, uh, the cost of it, the importance of it for trade, but then the benefits from the standpoint of the China-Laos corridor as a development corridor and what you mean by corridorization. I was happily surprised by seeing your article uh, published in the World Financial Review. Uh, it's called Corridorizing corridorizing impact along the Belt and Road is the newly operational China Laos a game changer. And that is a very important concept uh, of the corridors for our viewers to understand. But please let us know a bit about the China Laos Railway. Well, thank you. This is a very good question uh, and an exciting topic uh, to start our conversation. I think for most viewers, uh, the China Lost Railway, uh, which as Hussein just uh, indicated, uh, started its operation or its maiden run on December 3rd uh, last year. So it has only been uh, about three months uh, since its operation. But I would like to take the viewers back uh, to uh, 2014 when the idea uh, for the China Lost Railway uh, came into form. Uh, but it was delayed for a little bit due to domestic politics you know, within China. But then finally it broke ground uh, at the end of 2016. So it took only about five years you know, for a very complex, uh, large scale uh, real project to be completed. Uh, five years, around five years. So if you look at this railway, uh, if you can follow my cursor, you know, from the capital city of Yunnan province in southwestern China, in this uh, yellow dark, a slightly darker area. And the railroad comes down uh, through the border uh, to reach uh, a small border town of Mohan on the Chinese side and the border town of Botan on the Laos side. And then it uh, runs further down uh, through Wamperpong in northern Laos until it reaches uh, its terminus 
in the capital city of Benten uh, down here. The entire railroad runs about 1,000 kilometers with about 600 of it inside China between Kunming and the border and a little over 400 kilometers from the China Laos border to the capital city of Benten in Laos. And the railroad is unprecedented in two or three very important ways. The first of all, it is a very expensive project. It costs 5.9 billion US dollars overall to construct it. And the basic financing structure is divided between the debt portion and also the equity portion. So China accounts for about overall 60% of the overall financing, uh, well, 40% comes from loss. But within the debt portion, uh, China takes on about 70%, where loss is responsible for about 30%. And the same is true on the equity side. Again, a 70 to 30 split between the two countries. And of course, Laos has borrowed um, a large sum, about $480 million from the Import Export Bank of China to finance the equity portion because the government was not in a position to come up with. So if you compare this project, the cost, to other big important projects under the Bell Road banner, I would say this is the most expensive railway. Yes, uh, but, but it, is, it is due to the physical topological uh, conditions uh, of the whole section. I, if, I, if I understood is that it's mol most of it is on bridges, culverts, and tunnels. Very much so. So the, again, just, you know, the second most important railway project, you know, the one that runs from Addis Ababa, capital of Ethiopia to Djibouti, is $4.9 billion. Most of that, of course, runs on flight land, right? Much easier uh, terrain. But here, just to give the, you know, uh, a sense of the complexity of the difficult topography uh, along the route, you know, if you look at the thousand uh, kilometers, about a little over 70% of that is tunnels and bridges combined. And within China, for example, uh, the train goes through 75 tunnels and, sorry, uh, a little bit off. Within China, it's 93 tunnels and 160, 36 bridges. 93 tunnels, 136 bridges. And within Laos, it's 75 tunnels and 165 elevated bridges. So if you put that together, it covers 712 kilometers. So it's very difficult in terms of the technical uh, complexity and requirements. And of course, uh, that has uh, been resolved largely by the Chinese railroad builders who have accumulated a lot of expertise and experiences in building a tremendous network of high speed Road, road system within China that allows China to extend uh, the combined expertise and experience and bring over the border to Laos and was able to finish uh, the construction within a relatively short period of time. Yeah, so th this is, uh, that's where the, the cost uh, factor comes in, uh, uh, but also this is part of a larger context because uh, when the Belt and Road Initiative was launched, the China Indochina corridor was one of the important, one of the major six uh, major uh, corridors um, uh, defined by the Chinese side. So this yes, will extend so further this. beyond Laos. Very much so, you know, so it's good to uh, follow up with this broader map that shows the six regional economic corridors, including uh, the one that we have just touched on, which is number four on this map. 
And this is one of the two corridors that run north and south, just like the China Lost Railway from inside China, through the border, through Laos, Thailand, and connecting to Malaysia and Singapore. And this is also the corridor that ultimately they expected to be completed by an entire linked rail system, the Pan Asia Railway, that 16 countries you know, within Asia uh, discussed and signed on in 2006. Of course, we're still a long way you know, from that completed connected uh, railway that ultimately will also uh, go north and connect to uh, the European rail system, which we'll talk about a little bit later uh, of other types of corridors, uh, logistically uh, driven corridors that connecting Western China and to Europe. But again, you know, for the case at hand that we focus on, it's very important to realize it's not just the China Lost Railway, but this corridor, this railway is also driving the economic development uh, along what is now known as the China Lost Economic Corridor, which going beyond just the transportation, shipping of goods and services right. with the expectation that the railroad as the transportation spine of the corridor will stimulate other forms, exactly. other types of economic and social development along the stations, around the stations of the railway, which has 24 stations, mm -hmm. uh, and also the regions, the hinterlands around mm -hmm. the stations and connecting uh, the corridor-shaped development, the elongated shape yes. of development. If, if, Professor, if we go back to the first uh, map you showed, we have that, also we read that Laos is, a completely landlocked country. Now it is landlinked, as we can see from the broader capabilities. I mean, it has, of course, benefits for trade. As you wrote in your article, there are many goods uh, being transported uh, to China. The Laos uh, uh, produced uh, food, for example, products and other products, uh, rubber, uh, finding an easy way to China. That the trade aspect, yes, is important, but there are other issues here. I mean, you have all these rings around the corridor, uh, and also you you have the, as you said now, there is the impact of that transport capability for all the regions around it, you know, the east and to the west, and so on and so forth. I think this is a very important thing for people to understand to go away from the Silk Road as a trade route to the Silk Road as a development uh, corridor. Yes, I mean, uh, converting uh, the landlocked status of Laos to a land-linked uh, country is the fundamental driving force, I think, behind the construction of this uh, railroad. Because if you're thinking about the smaller, less or least developed countries, uh, there's a number of them around the world that are suffering you know, from being uh, landlocked and some of them have uh, uh, unfriendly uh, neighbors, uh, which is critical you know, to their development. I think for Laos, um, uh, before Laos, this railroad was constructed, most of the trade and the connections were um, by very uh, underdeveloped older uh, roads that also China helped build in the 1960s during the Vietnam War. You know, they really became dilapidated and, and very uh, narrow and difficult to, to time consuming to travel. So if you look further south from Laos, of course, uh, the connection to Thailand uh, obviously, it was uh, cut off, divided by the border, without a, a seaport to access uh, the ocean. Uh, so with Thailand now planning to accelerate its extension of the railroad going north to dock or connect with the China Laos Railway, that allows Laos to ultimately be able to ship goods and services and other kinds of cargo uh, 
you know, through Thailand uh, to access uh, the port of Bangkok and also uh, all the other extensions that might allow Laos also to connect to Cambodia uh, that will be able to uh, access the port of Sihanouk, which is also very important for a lot of the business and supply chains and delivery of goods and services from China. The Chinese investment companies in Laos rely on that port to ship it you know, around the South China Sea to Sihanouk and then bring it over land into Laos which is very, very time consuming. So if you look at this map again, just to finalize um, uh, this discussion point, the critical two you know, anchors to the railroads is the China laws economic cooperation zone on the border in the north and the Saseta comprehensive development zone in Vientiane in the south. So these two key economic anchors or key nodes bracket uh, the railroads. And the one along the border also is a bridging point, a relaying station between the much larger flows of goods. And increasingly, once the pandemic completely uh, allows international tourists to open, will help facilitate the flow of international and Chinese domestic visitors to take the railroads to visit uh, Laos and going further south to other parts of mainland Southeast Asia. Yeah, that's great. Uh, now there are also, I mean, we talk about the impact of this railway and other auxiliary. Of course, there were roads built around it to complete the work. There were other smaller roads built all over the place and people in those re remote regions in Laos use those roads now both to uh, bring uh, material for their own production, whether it's agricultural or industry, and ship their products to other places. I mean, I mean, without infrastructure, without roads, without power, without water, I mean, this will even have impact on the provision of electricity, of clean water, uh, all kinds of things will pop up. We, we have probably, I mean, there are two industrial zones, as you said, already established, uh, but we will have new industrial activities popping up along the road where you have human resources, natural resources, and that the benefit of the road will be, will multiply, quadruple, you know, uh, and have ripple effects all over the country. Yeah, this is uh, reminds exactly of the Chinese saying that if you want to get rich, build a road first. I think there's a comparable saying in Laos. Um, I don't know whether it's exactly the same, but it's very similar. Um, if you look at northern Laos, right, the hilly uh, northern countries of, of Laos, you know, is uh, primarily rural, uh, isolated, uh, weakly or poorly connected uh, to um, the capital city and to southern Laos. And uh, now the railroad has also facilitated some feeder roads, you know, some extensions uh, of the main uh, route and particular is key station in the north to have extended roads into the nearby adjacent uh, villages and towns, you know, which allow some of the farmers to use their tractors, you know, to bring um, mostly tropical fruits and also uh, some uh, cows, you know, that were raised in Northern Laos because it's becoming an important export item to China. Uh, China, I think, has agreed to import, you know, 50,000 uh, cows every year. Of course, Laos has not been able to reach that target, but now with the railroads, it'll be much easier, you know, for the farmers and the villagers, you know, to bring these goods to the nearby stations much more uh, quickly. Uh, so that's a, a tremendous advantage. But I would say overall, the railroads is poised to diversify the agricultural exports of Laos. That's a main contributor to the Laos GDP that has been growing rapidly. And now you have this big opening 
you know, this much faster shipping capacity that allows a lot more goods to flow and, and with much lower transportation costs. I think it's a reduction about 40, 50% mm -hmm. of shipping costs by the freight train, which also runs along the same route compared to the traditional, much older road parking transport. Yeah. And also you have the inflow of uh, tourism from China to this, uh, to this country, but also to its neighbors. So this will be an additional infusion of income uh, for the country. Very much so. Yes, I would just to add a quick point. If you look at the map, you know, the city or uh, in northern Laos of Lombardong is a UNESCO designated uh, tourist site mm -hmm. with Asian temples, with beautiful uh, sceneries. Actually, I took a group of students with other colleagues, uh, Trinity students, a few years ago. We traveled along this route, of course, at that time. Uh, we wish we had the train to ride on, you know, from Kunming all the way across the border to Luang You know, we had to go fly to Ventan from Kunming and then flew back. Mm -hmm. Took a much shorter commuter flight from Ventan back to Luang and then, you know, travel by bus, you know, within the region. Right. So uh, now in the future, I think uh, this tourist route, I think will become very popular. Obviously there is uh, optimistic projections, you know, for millions of Chinese tourists, you know, that would take this train uh, to uh, cross the border to visit Laos. Uh, you know, I think uh, uh, at least, you know, the short term uh, plan to use this railway by both governments, the national and also the provincial and city governments of Kunming and Laos is to really prioritize uh, tourism, trade uh, to target different sectors of the economy on both sides of the border to direct more traffic to this railroad. Yeah, and I, th I think of course the COVID-19 uh, pandemic had a, a certain effect on this not be taking off really, but I think in the coming months and probably years, this will be completely different. There was one more additional thing when you look at the map, I mean, although it's not mentioned in the, uh, your article, but I think this idea of the development corridor, you ha we have the mighty uh, Mekong River crossing also from the north, from China, through Laos, and through the rest of Indochina. This is a mighty river. I mean, this is both, will be a great source of power. I mean, I think there are lots of uh, 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 hydropower projects planned and under construction which will increase the production of electricity and power. It could be used for navigation, for river navigation, also as an additional transport uh, vehicle. But I, you, free, you feel free if you want to comment on that. Just a, a very quick comment. You know, again, you know, this is a, a controversial uh, uh, issue, I think, for uh, China and the lower Mekong uh, countries, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, right? Over the uh, increasing number of very large dams that were constructed in the upper reaches uh, of the Mekong, which is known as the Lantang River, you know, within China, in Yunnan province, uh, which obviously has changed, you know, the regular flows of the water uh, downstream uh, that, that affected uh, some agricultural farming, especially uh, all the way down at the Delta uh, in Vietnam. Again, you know, we took a group of Trinity students and studied that issue a few years ago, where we actually took a boat down, you know, the Mekong all the way to uh, uh, to Canton, uh, the city near uh, Ho Chi Minh City or, or Saigon. Uh, but I would say, you know, if you look at the connection between Mekong uh, and the railroads, uh, which really uh, um, passes or intersects and the border between Laos and Bangkok. And on the Thai side, uh, sorry, Laos and the Thailand, on the Thai side, you have the city of Mung Thai, which is ultimately will be the terminus, you know, for the Thai uh, railroad to go north and to connect with the China Laos railway. So that there is a, a bridge uh, crossing the Mekong at that point, traditionally before the railroad uh, was um, went into operation, people would cross the river uh, along that bridge 
so it was a very busy crossing, you know, for Thai traders and law traders and people visit each other across that river. Uh, of course, on the law side is the capital city of Ben Ken. So you, you, we we actually s uh, stood on the on the side of the river. You can look actually look across. It's uh, the you know, the country on the other side is with, within almost a stone's throw. But now I think with the, the railroads and waiting for the Thai side of the railroads to connect, and I think that bridge will become even more important that it will allow the stations to be connected in such a way that it will allow the railroads to actually pass the bridge through and then could immediately connect it to the highways. Right now, uh, the missing link, you know, forces the, uh, the cargo that will have to be unloaded, which would have to move across the border, across the Mekong, and then, you know, in Thailand, you know, it will have to be trucked uh, to other places, uh, which is obviously not as convenient and not as time efficient. Yeah, great. Uh, well, if we go further into this idea of the corridorization and corridors, I mean, this is some, and also what is called urban corridors. Uh, you reference in your article of scientific study uh, by a group, I think, German um, researchers, it's called a global inventory of urban corridors based on perceptions and nighttime light imagery. And they have a fascinating, of course, a fascinating study of a number of uh, real corridors. Uh, I mean, they reference the uh, most famous one is in the uh, the boss Washington, the United States, extending from Washington all the way to Boston. Uh, but they have another number of uh, important corridors. Now, this is a, a very important thing for people to understand uh, that how does these corridors impact the economic, social, and other matters of a, a society, but also on regional basis, and maybe we can go to continental uh, corridors. Yes, you know, this is obviously a very broad, uh, very layered and complex topic. So uh, we can start from, a, you know, different places, but I'd say let's start with uh, what you just referenced, you know, the Boss Wash Corridor, which is this map on the left, uh, I have three examples here, three out of the 67 uh, corridors, urban corridors that you refer to in that article by the three German scholars. And Boswash, uh, it was highlighted by that study. And also it's a, a classic case, if you will, of a long corridor, but within national boundaries. Yeah, and can you see, use the uh, browser also to? to yeah, point you can to, see, you know, yeah. from obviously Boston in the north uh, and, and down south across, uh, bypassing New York, uh, and then um, um, finishes uh, the city of Boston. And of course, uh, Hartford, a city where I am now, where Trinity is located, is obviously on this corridor, uh, Connecticut between Massachusetts uh, and New York. You know, this corridor, you know, was recognized by um, a, a French American, you know, geographer uh, back in the um, 1960. So even though, you know, some of the earlier uh, elements and uh, uh, evidence of a, a connected uh, city, suburban development uh, was already happening. Um, I mean, if you look at the features uh, of two other cases here, obviously, you know, more connected to where you are, in Europe, we have also what was known as the blue banana, right, that connected, uh, you know, maybe somewhere around Manchester uh, in the north and down to Milan and Italy, in northern Italy, across uh, six, seven advanced industrial economies. Um, you know, we don't talk about it much anymore, but you know, in the 1980s, uh, before the EU uh, formally came into existence and opened up all the borders, this was very important because it, it uh, facilitated uh, a lot of the open flows of uh, factors of production. And of course, in East Asia, uh, which is obviously much closer to uh, uh, the case we just talked about, uh, you also had a much more complex 
uh, land and sea combined corridor, right? You know, from Beijing uh, through uh, Seoul to to Tokyo, the Baseto corridor. Now, if you if you compare these corridors, the earlier corridors, right, that were recognized in the '60s and studied in the '70s and then uh, in the '80s, compared to the six corridors uh, under the BRI, the first major difference I would say would be scale, scale in terms of length and also width. Right, the 67 corridors studied by these three German scholars, you know, they range between 400 to 1,000 kilometers, typically. Most of them are shorter. Yeah, but they, they also are... focus on clusters of cities and yeah. industrial production centers. But I think it's, it's the, the point I think, which is, should be emphasized that the impact on the economic growth of connecting these clusters of cities with develop with with the transport especially highways railway that this the issue is how to increase the effective connection but also the productivity of the economies of these regions because you have regions where you have raw materials you have regions where you have technology you have regions where you have population you have regions where you have water so if you effectively can connect all of them this would mean that you can create a massive industrial agricultural zones of production. Yes, I mean, I think, you know, to, to really understand, I think, you know, the fundamental um, characteristics of these corridors, we really should be thinking about three axes or three dimensions, right? The, the basic one, you know, the basic driver is transportation, the infrastructure side of the corridor, the connected roads, the rail lines, uh, and so on. The second, I would say, would be the urban dimension, urban development, connecting cities and large and small cities, medium sized cities. And then, of course, the hinterlands uh, in, the, in the Bosch Wash case will be, you know, small suburban towns between major cities. And the third and final most critical dimension is what you actually reference is the economic development dimension. So for these corridors to really be successful, all three aspects would have to be integrated in, in, a, in an effective um, manner that would facilitate uh, flows of different kinds and to generate multiplier effects and generate spillover effects uh, and to uh, help reduce you know, the gaps the inequities, the inequalities that would exist, you know, between the major cities. Right. And I think these three scholars use the term active spaces or passive spaces, because when you have these very long corridors, there ought to be, right, spaces that are quote yes. unquote dead. Yeah. You know, there are no activities. Right. Uh, if so we go, if we go to the next one with the BRI corridors, maybe that gives us a sense of. Yes, I mean, if you look at the BR corridors, right, they're much longer. For example, you know, number six, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. It runs 3,000 kilometers, you know, from the port of Guada in southern Pakistan and all the way north through the mountains, the Karakoran the, snowy yeah. mountains uh, to connect to the city of Kashgar, which is obviously, again, an Asian city on the Silk Road and then to, uh, to Xinjiang yes. uh, in Northwestern China. And so a lot more difficult terrains and, and, and difficult uh, 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 bo uh, borders and difficult uh, barriers would have to cross. A couple other quick differences. Hmm. And if you compare the earlier corridors to the BRI corridors, I would say, of course, the BRI corridors is China initiated, anchored to inside China, and originating and then extending out, right? So China exactly. is the central player. Another very key difference is that the BRI corridors are, have a much more state involvement and intervention and state driven, especially from China. But also importantly to recognize is the BRI corridors, if you look at this map, they cover many more international borders or border regions and touching a lot more underdeveloped 
cities, remote cities, regions of developing countries compared with the early corridors, most of which took form within the more advanced Western industrial economies. Some were in the emerging, you know, large developing countries, but they only connect largely between two or three major cities. But here, these corridors, the six BRI corridors, they involve a much larger number of cities of greater variety, of greater functionality. Right. There's a there's a certain difference, of course. I mean, the clusters we talked about in the Europe and the United States, you have a larger dense population density uh, in these areas, but also you have a more advanced uh, technological uh, uh, level. I mean, in China, you mentioned the fact that China did build these um, very effective, uh, now still developing, like the Yangtze River Economic Belt, the Beijing Tianjin Economic Corridor. We have the Pearl River Delta in the south of China, but what, the, what is special about these is you have a very, very high population density. But if we look at the uh, China, Central Asia, West Asia economic corridor, which goes for a big part in almost desert areas, unpopulated desert areas, but yes. they are important both to connect the major cities, east and west, but also you have natural resources uh, in these regions to be connected to the major uh, economic activity, which is driven by China. But also on the, in the Western side, you have another node, you have these two nodes, one is China, one is in Europe, and in between you have a large area which is underdeveloped. And I, what do you, th you think this is, you, if we expand that and make it make it very, very large, how would that help develop those countries, alleviate poverty, I mean, we have the case in Africa, we have very acute problems in the Great Lakes regions, for example, uh, yes. where they are completely landlocked. There are no roads from the, the Atlantic or from the uh, Indian Ocean. Like Rwanda, Burundi, I looked in 2013 at the cost of mm. shipping from China to those countries and to Europe. I mean, a ship uh, container cost less to ship from China to Hamburg than from China to Kigali. It costs three times more from China to Kigali in uh, Rwanda uh, than going to Hamburg, which is much, much farther. But because there is no connection between the Indian Ocean and Rwanda, so the costs are incredible for the population. And that's one of the big bottlenecks, as President Xi Jinping said, for development in Africa. Yes, this is very much goes back, you know, to the landlocked versus land link countries, right? How do you create um, uh, previously non-existing uh, shipping and transport links uh, to allow, for example, using this map to illustrate the long distance connections, right? So you think about corridors, you know, the older, you know, uh, shorter, uh, traditional, unplanned, market-driven uh, corridors in advanced economies. But here, we're talking about corridors that stretch over 10,000 kilometers. If you look at uh, a particular real connection, say, between the Chinese city of Yiwu, you know, the world's largest uh, small yeah. merchandise yeah. distribution center. Yeah, I've been there. That it's impressive. <laughs> yeah, that connects all the way, of course, to, to Madrid, right? To London and, and, and to Madrid. You yeah. know, those are the two longest uh, uh, freight rail lines. They mm. are running uh, 13,000 kilometers. So I think the key to understand these corridors is to, again, getting back to this very uneven uh, composition of very different kinds of cities, uh, major urban centers, but yet uh, cities on the margin and cities on the border or near the border now have actually become very important logistics hubs. You know, they're like relaying stations. So if you look at this chart uh, from one uh, another article of mine, you can actually get a very clear sense of how the original domestic development of China, you know, which starts from Shenzhen, the Perdiver Delta, and then moving north and then covering the entire Eastern seaboard, right? The Yangtze River Delta in the middle and then connecting to Beijing and Tianjin and Hebei in the north 
And of course, that you know, one of the questions that you have in mind is, you know, the high speed corridor between, you know, two uh, major cities in northern China. But then, if you look from east to west, right, you suddenly find there are new regions that are connected or around, revolve around much different cities mm. in China. You know, the much less developed secondary cities in central and western China, and more interestingly, much, much smaller cities by Chinese standard that stand on the border between China and Kazakhstan. So if you look at zone two, 2A, two mm. and then you see Alashanko and Horgos, and then also city Arlen Hauter in Inner Mongolia, and Manjoli that borders the China-Russian uh, border. So these cities now allow these trains to run through more and more efficiently, you know, through custom clearance, through, you know, uploading and downloading, because they really are the key connecting point between the standard gateways in China and the wider gauges in Kazakhstan in Russia and in Belarus, and then we have to go back to the standard gateways, which is 1.43 meters wide, as opposed to be a 1.52 that's used in the former Soviet Union. So, mm -hmm. so, so that's another uh, hurdle that will have to be uh, uh, crossed or uh, cleared and through more coordinations, not only between the national governments of all six, seven, eight countries, but also the sub-national governments that will have to work together to create coordination. Right. Uh, that, that applies even in times of crisis. One of the ironies of the situation in Ukraine now is that actually, and we have followed the uh, China EU Express, the rail freight uh, route, actually they go through from China to Kazakhstan, but through Russia and Belarus. And this is a war zone, but all the trains, I have <laughs> talked to experts, they say the trains are still running. Running, yes. Because uh, these are very important for the Western European countries and for China, of course. But that the, this is so crucial that even in a time of war and crisis, the, they have to continue uh, rolling, which is yes. a, a, a small bright spot in the, horrible situation we have. Yeah, I have some really very uh, fresh, uh, updated uh, news about how China is handling it, right? You know, from the uh, originating uh, departing cities, uh, such as, you know, the uh, key uh, cities in uh, northwestern China, the city of Xi'an, right? This is the uh, Asian uh, city of Chang'an, which yeah. anchored the uh, Asian Silk Road from the east. And now it's uh, a critical uh, logistic hub, you know, for the China-Europe uh, trains. Right. And, uh, but also getting back to your earlier point, how the interior cities of China, like Xi'an, now has uh, connected back to the east coast of China that have allows, say, the major Korean electronics manufacturer of LG, which has now set up a factory in Poland, mm -hmm. in the city of Słoko, 60 miles west of the city of Krakow. Before the war, it would bring the parts and components from Korea to the port of Qingdao on the east coast of China and then brought to Xi'an by train, reconsolidated, and then going west through Kazakhstan, Russia. And also for this particular route, it would actually go through Ukraine. Of course, now it is impossible, but the train has been redirected back to the more major route, going from Belarus, Belarus. from Minsk to Brest, across the border into Poland, and then brought over to the factory in, in Sloko, which is a small city. So we're seeing these long train-driven infrastructure directed corridors have begun to redirect and restructure global supply chains. Right. Even in times of war, this particular route has not actually been disrupted. In right. fact, the Chinese uh, company that runs the logistics of these trains are 
in real time monitoring how many trains are where at any given time. So right now, as we speak, there are 20 some trains that are either in Russia or in Kazakhstan or in Poland. Mm. And they're going to different destinations in mm. Europe. Right. Yeah, that, that's a very fascinating aspect of things. I, I, I was actually supposed to uh, go visit these hubs in Belarus and also the great uh, industrial park called the, the Great Stone Industrial Park. The Great Stone Park, yes. In Belarus, but uh, because of the situation, it was impossible uh, because I wanted to see firsthand how these uh, logistics and transport hubs work, but also what is the impact of that industrial park because it's a massive industrial park with Chinese companies uh, m making huge investments there. And of course, that will affect the economic situation in the country, but also how it will connect East and West uh, uh, in, in, from this country. But anyway, well, hopefully uh, we will have a, a better situation uh, soon that this whole crisis is resolved and we can uh, go back to the uh, ability to have the a method of working among nations and the economic cooperation because we don't believe that you know that without economic cooperation without trade it's very difficult to establish peace and i think yes i mean i i would respond i mean that's a, a great point you know uh, so important uh, to think about you know how um the economic uh trade connections between China and all these countries in East and Central Europe uh, and Western Europe. Obviously, uh, China has tremendous amount of um, uh, investment uh, and trade in, Bela in both Belarus uh, and uh, Ukraine, uh, and obviously relies on Russia and Kazakhstan, you know, for these trains to go through. And uh, uh, that, you know, obviously complicates, you know, the, the geopolitical um, uh, dynamics uh, that we're looking at, uh, you know, through the lens, of course, of the uh, of the conflict, uh, which is again, you know, uh, where a lot of people would uh, look at China and say, "Why are you still on the fence?" Right? And and in in terms of your um, uh, reactions. Um, so anyway, that that's a, a long story, you know, maybe for another day. But I think it's so also so closely connected. In right. terms of the geoeconomic structure or new structure, new formation that I have seen that have been brought into existence uh, as a result of, of this corridor development that, that straddle uh, borders that are taken on this transcontinental scale, uh, that are um, uh, taking on a larger proportion or share of the China Europe trade. Uh, you know, if you look at the number of the trains, that started from uh, 15, 17 in 2011. 10 years later, last year, uh, the total number of trains that are running in both directions uh, uh, reached 15,000. Yeah, and you have traffic jam also. There's so much yes. demand, but there is not enough physical infrastructure, rail, right. to carry yeah. that demand. I mean, we saw this during the beginning of the COVID-19. This route became so important for us here in Europe to bring all the supplies, medical supplies, the, the personal protection uh, the material for the people working in the healthcare, all these things. It, this route was very, very important because it was important to bring these things quickly and smoothly through. But uh, that's that's really the, the whole issue about this, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. We do really believe in our institute that the best way to ease tension among nations, to establish a new method, uh, mode of, uh, uh, people call it order, <laughs> uh, international order, is through economic cooperation. I think the Belt and Road Initiative has shown uh, that this is a perfect because it, it transcends all political, cultural, and social differences and focuses on what is uh, universal in a sense, what every society needs. And that's the, these are mostly economic matters, but also it can start a, a dialogue of cultures among people when they start cooperating. But I think the Belt and Road is very important. Uh, it's important for 
China and Europe and the United States, as we, you have shown that we do have technological and other capabilities and knowledge and know-how, which will be of great benefit for eliminating poverty in the world. But without building infrastructure, without building these development corridors, it's very, very difficult. So, I mean, finally, if you don't have anything further on this uh, question, uh, I don't, would you like to say yes, anything? I'd like maybe to, uh, you know, to have a, a couple of final remarks, uh, maybe, you know, kind of key takeaways, if you will, from our conversation. Uh, I would say two points, I would say, you know, I could say more, but, uh, but I think the first critical um, summary point is really to think about, you know, the kind of challenges uh, facing uh, this sweeping uh, scaled uh, global kind of initiative, right? That has both the transnational connection and also the translocal level um, connections and many barriers, many hurdles would have to be uh, overcome. And one of them is really this very uneven uh, development of cities of different kinds. You know, these smaller cities that are now have emerged as, as sort of a critical logistic hubs, the relaying stations. And because they start from very small and some of them even from a rural base, and they cannot quickly you know, um, scale up and develop the capacity to handle, you know, the growing uh, number and um, of, of these trains going through, right? That's the, uh, the border congestion you refer to. I think the second most important point, I think uh, very often, I think there's really a, the misunderstanding or uninformed understanding of the Belt Road corridors. That they're often seen as trade, uh, facilitation only, uh, or, or logistics. In fact, I would say, you know, they carry tremendous amount of opportunities for longer term and more sustainable development. And a lot of that development goes beyond just the bilateral or multilateral trade. It really has, I would say, a touchdown impact on people's lives. A quick example would be how the railroad combined with special economic zones in Africa between say Ethiopia and Djibouti has created a lot of um, factory jobs, uh, employment and skill transfers and training that allow you know, also a growing number of women you know, to now working yeah, as, many industrial um, parks built around the industrial parts yeah. and, and uh, working both also as, as uh, attendants, conductors on the train in the China Lost Railway where we started. I'd like to close on that because recently they have began to hire 200 new people, both engineers and drivers and, uh, um, and attendants working on the train. And China has also developed, built a new railroad engineering academy located in Benten, the capital city, to train the future generation of technicians and, and drivers to localize the transfer of the technology and the knowledge to allow the trains to run more sustainably. I think these longer term uh, payoffs that we don't necessarily see right now especially connected with these uh, large scale infrastructure, which has a much longer uh, time horizon, you know, for uh, paying off the, obviously the tremendous amount of debt and also uh, generating enough economic revenue, right? To allow the debt uh, pay off, but also to really trickle into uh, much of other sectors of the economy. I, I think, you know, we're still in the very early stage, barely nine years into the Belt Road Initiative, and we already see tremendous amount of evidence yeah. uh, on the promising, the early stage of the development that has already taken roots in many parts of the world in the form of these large scale transport infrastructure, but many more localized small scale livelihoods projects, such as you know, a single bridge that crossing a river in a country that allow local residents to easily cross the river instead of waiting for the ferry 
And I can give you multiple examples of that, not just in Africa, uh, but in Asia near Dhaka, the Padman Bridge, but also in Belgrade, right? Mm -hmm. In the capital city, which a bridge now connects, you know, two different parts of the city. You know, now it takes only 10 minutes to cross the river instead of driving around for over an hour. So these things make differences, you know, to people's mm -hmm. lives at the grassroots. And I think we really need to you know, highlight some of these examples as also a part of this um, secondary, you know, tertiary effects. And I think going forward, we're probably likely to see more of these kind of livelihood projects uh, taking on more of uh, importance and attracting more attention. Right. That, that's, that's very, very fascinating. I'm sure we would need to meet again to go through some more of these fascinating and very good examples on that infrastructure is not to generate financial benefit, but it's a social economic benefit, which is not visible in terms of how much money you get by selling tickets to people. That's not really the, right. the purpose of infra, infrastructure. The purpose of infrastructure, infrastructure is to increase the productivity of labor in that country by helping utilize all its resources to the most possible level. And without that, without transport, electricity, water, you cannot have a modern economy. And I think, I'm sure, Professor, if your time allows, we need to meet again, because there is so Definitely. much you can tell us uh, uh, from both East and West, from your studies, your, yep. your own uh, visits and field uh, research and I was very, I'm very, very happy that you took the time to be with us. And uh, I'm sure our viewers had learned a lot in this uh, conversation. Thank you very much, well, Professor. Thank well, thank you, Hussein. Again, I, I want to just maybe leave the, uh, the parting word by referring to the image behind me. And this is fundamentally, you know, the, 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 uh, the past and present connection, right? You know, the Asian Silk Road, you know, uh, is the Campbell's uh, Inspire, you know, the 21st century uh, connectivity uh, project that are symbolized by the trains running uh, across the continent. So uh, I, uh, it's just the cover of, uh, of one of my recent uh, short books, and I'll be happy to talk about, um, about it, you know, with more of examples and, and greater nuances uh, if we have the opportunity again. Thank you again for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you too. We enjoyed it too. Uh, I will have the link to your recent article I mentioned about the China Laos uh, below in the description of the video so people can see it. They can also find your the contact to you if the people have want to ask direct questions. But I'm sure we will have you again on our show and uh, have more really, questions really, to you. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Until much. Until next time. Next time. Bye-bye.